Well, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm Todd Sears, the founder of Out Leadership, and I'm here with Stephanie Sandberg, Managing Director of Out Leadership as well. Good afternoon. And we have our Out Leadership coffee mugs because it just felt like the thing to do. It did. And this is not vodka, I promise. <laughs> Thanks for joining. <laughs> Todd is going to make a few introductory remarks, and then I'll demonstrate with some data points, and then introduce our panelists for the bulk of the afternoon show. <laughs> afternoon show. Yeah. Right. Perfect. So um, I do want to kick off by thanking you for joining us. Um, if you're a member of our leadership, thank you for your support. Um, we've grown from six companies to now 68 companies and five continents of the world. Uh, and the, the work that we're able to do with our summits, with our initiatives around talent, LGBT leadership, executive leadership, are all because of the support you're giving us. So thank you for that. Uh, I'm incredibly excited uh, to talk a little bit about OLIQ this afternoon. Um, for those who are familiar with it, hopefully this will give you even a more in-depth understanding of how we've built it, why we've built it, uh, and how companies are using it to drive some success. Uh, and for those of you who are new to it, hopefully it'll get you excited about it, uh, because it's something we at Out Leadership have spent almost two years building, uh, and I think it's going to be an important tool, not just for our member companies, but for companies broadly around the world. So with that, I wanted to spend probably three to five minutes just walking you through a few key things. First, why we built it and what we hope to achieve with it. Two, how it's different. Uh, and then three, how companies are starting to use it, and that'll be a nice lead-in to Stephanie and our panelists. So first, let me just talk about why we built it. Um, as a former banker and uh, diversity leader myself, I both, one, am very metrics-focused, uh, and two, have had the experience of leading diversity initiatives for multinational corporations in which we use indices like the Corporate Equality Index or the Stonewall Index in the UK or Community Businesses Index in Hong Kong or Pride and Diversities Index in Sydney, all of which were fantastic. And I can think back to my days at Merrill Lynch and leveraging the CEI to actually help Merrill make the case that transgender medical benefits were going to be important to the bottom line of the firm from a brand perspective. Uh, and I would, I would probably posit that HRC's Corporate Quality Index has driven more change within corporate hierarchy and structures than almost anything out there. Having said all of that, I think there was an opportunity uh, to fill a gap in the marketplace. And what I mean by that is these indices, as fantastic as they are, are public, regional, not necessarily business focused, they're HR and policy focused, uh, and they're not necessarily benchmarkable to a company. So you as a company take the index, you get a score, you may or may not know how that score compares across the different areas that that score measures. And so what we wanted to do with OLIQ was try to fill that gap. And let me just talk about some of the key pieces. The first is the public versus private. And you can see on the slide, um, we'll have to put the slide up. Um, you can see on the slide a little bit more of the detail, but let's just start with the public piece. What we found is companies are not as likely to take one of these public indices uh, the CEI or the Stonewall Index, community business, et cetera, unless they're sure they're going to make 100%. Um, and understandably so, right? If your score is going to be made public, you don't have the ability to take the risk that it would not be a positive score. Uh, the challenge with that is that companies are really, they have to focus on marketing themselves. They have to make themselves look as good as possible to keep that 100% score. What we want to do with OLIQ was give a company a private opportunity to actually really be open about where they are as a company as it relates to their LGBT opportunity. So what that means is that the company does not have to prove to us anything. There's no uh, secondary check. There's no sort of materials that have to be submitted. The company literally takes the diagnostic test and is honest as they can be. And the only people that will see the score will be our leadership and the company, which means that the company can literally share with us where they think they're doing well and where they think they're doing poorly or not as well. And so that's the first difference. The second is that we have seven dimensions that OLIQ measures, only one of which is HR and policy. The other six focus on business opportunity, leadership, market, clients. And again, our hope is that you're looking at LGBT opportunity, LGBT opportunity holistically, because we do think that there's more to LGBT opportunity than just an HR policy. And I think if you look at it in the abstract, but also in practice, when you're looking around the world, we have in the U.S., just taking the U.S. for example, there are, I believe, 887 companies that have taken the Corporate Equality Index in the U.S. This last year, 510 of them scored 100%, which is truly phenomenal. It's a record in 14 years of the CEI. Having said that, 46% of employees are still in the closet at work. So we know that there's something missing. There's not just policy. Policy does not equal culture. There's a gap. And that's what we're trying to address with OLIQ. 
We're hoping that companies will take the test, it takes an hour and a half, and then get a score. Ultimately, the more companies we have in the system, we'll be able to benchmark it, and then we'll be able to say across these seven dimensions, here's where you have done very well, here's where you have opportunity to improve, and then ideally, here are best practices and recommendations that we out leadership can make based off of our global reach, our understanding, the work from our summits, and the best practices from other companies. So I'm hopeful that as we go through the next 45 minutes or so, uh, that the panelists will be able to walk you through how they've used it for their companies. We've got some great success stories. Um, and then hopefully answer some of the questions that folks have. I think that the biggest one, and that's why I wanted to start with it, was how this is different. So hopefully you can understand the, the fact that it's private, benchmarkable, business focused, um, quick to take, and global, uh, that it will let you see your global opportunity, not just the US or not just the UK, but everywhere your company does business. Um, and I think the final thing I'll say is, as you're taking it, and I hope you'll give us feedback on it, the benefit that we have with it being a proprietary out leadership tool is that we can improve it. We can add to it. We can add in correlations. We can add in correlations to non-LGBT indices, like the gender equality indices, or things around sustainability or CSR. Uh, so if there are things that your company in particular would be interested in seeing, let us know. Uh, because 2.0 version of OLIQ could include a lot more and be even more useful to our companies. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie to introduce the panel, and I want to thank our panelists in advance. They've been very generous with their time, and I'm going to swap out with, uh, with our friend Jeff from RBC and turn it over to Stephanie. So thanks for joining us. Thank you, Todd. Uh, well, Jeff, I think you better come sit next to me, even though I'm going to show a couple of slides before allowing you to say too much. Um, one thing to add on to what Todd was suggesting is that as we continue to evolve the, the survey, while we will be able to better dimensionalize it and, and be more comprehensive in the results, at the same time, the more we know from an algorithmic perspective, the shorter the survey itself will become, so the less time it will actually take. Um, so I just wanted to, to, to add on the value there isn't going to be that it will take you longer, you'll get more, but you won't need to take uh, quite as long. I'm going to go through two slides and then introduce the panelists. Um, just to give you guys a quick sense of uh, the financial services benchmark, um, which we have completed because we have, um, as most of you know, um, an overrepresentation of financial services industries in, who belong to um, our leadership. I have another slide following which shows uh, the averages for all of the companies that have taken it. Truth be told, uh, we haven't yet gotten quite to 20 or so, but it's enough to, to have an emerging story and certainly for a robust conversation um, today. So a quick glance, um, you guys can see on your, on your screens, um, a perfect score on the OLIQ would mean that your company is kind of levitating in the LGBT um, biosphere, uh, which is to say that 100 is almost not possible to get. But we put uh, this survey together in order to capture every single thing that a company could do to drive financial and business success. And if a company did all of these things to make their company more LGBT inclusive, it would translate into uh, an astonishing score. So the first thing I want to say is, with an average score of 50, and all of the firms, almost to a company who have taken it so far, score 100 on, on the CEI, um, you can tell that it's an aspirational uh, uh, survey, one that demonstrates opportunity while um, you know, showing areas where, where companies are performing well, but it's more about opportunity than it is strengths, as one can see you know, with, the, with the specifics that come out on, on the scores. So I want to say um, two things before delving a little further into these numbers. One is to just wrap up on what Todd was saying. Um, the data reveals where you are. It's a snapshot for opportunity and strengths and weakness and, and giving you a plan to act on if you uh, so desire. And from a benchmarking perspective, of course, it lets you see how you're doing relative to your peers, um, whether it's by size, region, uh, industry, or, or just in general. Um, I also have to say that um, we developed this with mathematical policy research, um, and we appreciate their uh, engagement in helping us bring you know, Todd's many years and the company's many years of working with you know, hundreds of companies on this axis and then translating it into defensible data and a way to get the information that's pretty ironclad. So just to put that out there as well, it wasn't just a brainstorming session. 
uh, here in our offices. It actually reflects almost two years' worth of really figuring out what questions to ask, how to weight the answers, and what they correlate to in terms of uh, potential business impact. So you see the financial services here. Um, uh, I won't go through each of them, but the weaker areas, um, as we'll see it deeper in our conversation, tend to be things around external communications and monitoring. Um, and I just have to put out a plug that obviously our, our whole um, philosophy with putting this together as well is if you can't measure something, uh, needless to say, it's very hard to improve it, let alone um, define where the opportunities are. So may I go to the next slide, Paul? So that's the financial services. We're happy to make this available to anybody. There's no secret in the aggregate data. And this is just overall um, and dimensionalized a little bit differently so that you can see by area um, graphically how, where companies tend to do well and where the opportunities are. And we'll get into that more in our conversation a little bit. Um, leadership is the most importantly weighted um, average in this survey because we think leadership uh, and all the things that come with that in the survey will drive impact more than anything from the top. Um, and so there's room for improvement there. Um, the, the strongest performances right now relative to our survey are in um, culture and policy. Um, not a big surprise given that policy has been um, the most public piece of uh, companies uh, getting their LGBT inclusive houses in order. Um, and you can see here where the monitoring and the external engagement lags a little bit. Um, so we'll get into that in our conversation. So let me introduce our panelists. And I will start, um, well, we have Gail Gibson, who's head of engineering for DuPont. They're going to make their screen appearance. We wanted to have a dramatic entrance for everyone. Uh, Gail Gibson from DuPont, soon or now called Dow DuPont, but I, I'm staying with DuPont. Chris Crespo is inclusiveness director for EY, and Jeff Formanak is with me here in our offices, and he's a director at RBC Capital Markets, and uh, thought it smarter to not do this from the trading floor today. Um, so thank you three for joining. So I am going to start with one question for everyone, just again to continue clarifying for everyone. How was taking the OLIQ survey different from HRC's Corporate Quality Index, whether in the taking of the survey um, and also, of course, um, any learnings along the way. Um, so top line, let's start with you, Chris, since you're an inclusiveness director. Baseline, what, how did that differ for you in taking all like I, I think the big, sure, the, 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 and, and thank you uh, for having us. Um, I, you know, I think one of the biggest differences was, Addy, why we've been used to taking the CEI for so long now that we knew it. So we almost don't even look into the questions anymore or look into the things that uh, we, we, could, we could try and learn from. We, we kind of know what, what to expect. Um, but with this, it was brand new. It gave us a, a, a different look and it gave us the opportunity to talk with some different people because there were different kinds of questions. And then with even the answers that we knew on a regular basis, there were, there were things that we hadn't thought of before mm -hmm. that, that brought out things like, well, how do you measure that? On, on top of not only do you do it, but how do you measure it? And, and so that gave us pause. Um, but I, I still think the, the biggest piece that made it different for us was trying to take that global look and trying to do it from the global perspective. Um, when, when we first started trying to complete it, we tried to complete it at the global level, realized that we were going to have a really hard time doing that, and we actually scaled back then to focus a little bit more country by country because we thought that would be a really neat opportunity for us to, to have going forward. But so that, that was some of the, the different things that we learned just from, just from the first run of it. Awesome. Gail, how about from DuPont's perspective? Yeah, thank you. And, and probably very similar to Chris's remarks for EY, um, in, in DuPont, we've been at this a long time. Um, I always enjoy things that help raise the bar. And in this case, this is sort of asking questions maybe we weren't as used to. It's thought provoking. It maybe is a little frustrating because it's like, oh, I hadn't thought of that or who do I ask about that attribute? But it really illustrates, um, you know, all of this is related to, at the end of the day, culture and performance of employees. And that, from an engineering perspective, since I'm an engineer, that's a system. And systems have many, many interrelated elements. And you've really got to diagnose piece by piece 
um, what is going to matter more than something else. So I think you can get into these as probably a lot of us are like A students from school or something and sort of go, well, why are they asking that or is that as relevant or how many points is that going to be? But when you kind of step back from all that and go, wow, this is really a beautiful tool to teach many systemic elements that are interrelated and, and that leads you to sort of look at your company and go, well, we can pick and choose what's right for us, right? If you're B2B, maybe we don't want certain, uh, you know, top scores in, in external communications on some things, but we want to do more in the leadership area. So I, I think that's also the beauty. It gives you a path. You know, sometimes uh, other surveys that are focused very much on policy, it's a, it's a binary answer, yes or no, we have it. But what it doesn't help you with is the path. What are some nuggets and crumbs that we can begin to follow of how to improve? And I think this gives you many different insights on that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I love the systems analogy. We're gonna, I'm going to use that if that's okay anytime soon. So Jeff, please share your own yeah, experience. Thank you for having us. I, I think the most powerful thing for us was the fact that it was internal. Um, you know, the policy benchmark has been set, uh, set high with the CEI and, uh, and I think that familiarity that uh, Chris touched, touched upon when, when we start doing the OLIQ and uh, using it as an internal measure, um, we're able to uncover some of the unknown unknowns mm -hmm. that we hadn't really considered yet. And I, and I think that was really illuminating for us because, you know, when, when you're taking a survey and you get your results and, and find that, you know, this isn't going to be shared uh, broadly, so it's not... Um, a, or at all. Or at all, exactly. You know, you can choose how you share it within your company. It's internal. So we're able to use the information and use it as a path forward to change, you know, some of the, some of the strategies that we're, we're embarking on. Mm -hmm. What does, does has, has RBC um, in, in, the, in the thinking and talking about strategy around inclusiveness, is data a has data been a piece of that? Has, has, is there discussion of sort of a cohesive strategy before this? Is this part of what this, what I'm trying to sell obviously is the idea of using data. Um, and I don't, I don't know well enough yet how often that's been discussed at the company level. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the things that we, we uncovered through this is that there's real opportunity for us to use data and set these metrics internally because you know, all of the companies are, uh, you know, investing a huge amount of resources into LGBT inclusion. Uh, but at the end of the day, we didn't really have a way to actually measure the effectiveness of, mm -hmm. of those results other than the policy changes that we're making. Mm -hmm. And so when, when we found out that there was, you know, a big opportunity to incorporate data and metrics and monitoring into our strategy, I think that really under, uh, really uncovered how, you know, we can set a foundation for our strategy and find ways to measure it over time. So Chris, EY is just a, a huge leader obviously in the space um, uh, and a thought leader in um, exploring ways to be LGBT inclusive. How much has data and measuring before this played a part in that conversation and in the sort of philosophical approach to cracking this nut. Yeah, I think, uh, what is it, the, the shoemaker's son's shoes never get made as well as the, uh, I think sometimes we fall prey to some of that ourselves in that uh, when we look at, at all the, the ways we use measurement, we like to either measure things until the point that we never get to actually act on them or we, or we don't measure at all at, at times. But uh, no, in, 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 in all seriousness, um, I, I think that was part of what stood out in, in OLIQ for me was there were some things we were doing. We knew that we were measuring. Uh, we were a little bit light on measuring the impact of them. But like on the philanthropy section, for example, that was a good example where the, the report really helped us narrow in on that, that we knew we were doing a lot of great things around philanthropy, but would never put a return on investment on it. You know, we had a strategy around why we were doing it, 
um, but we'd never measured it, and so therefore it was hard to articulate it. And that was one of the things that the report pointed out to us afterwards that, that really helped us in, in thinking through, okay, how do we look at each one of these pieces? We know we're good in this place, this place, and, and, and this part of the, of the survey, um, but philanthropy was one that, that we looked at and said, okay, there's some, some room for improvement there as a result of that. Mm -hmm. So trying to figure out how best to articulate then what is a return on investment for us through our philanthropy yeah. giving and how yeah. we align that with the rest of the corporate responsibility metrics that we have. Mm -hmm. So, by the way, I should tell our viewers and listeners that you may type in your questions on your control panel, and Paul, um, who is monitoring and today's producer, um, will collect the, collect, collect the questions and pass them along to me when we get to questions uh, at about uh, 2.45. So, Gail, at DuPont, you guys measure everything, and your scientists and engineers. Um, is inclusiveness uh, traditionally part of that? whether LGBT or not, or is LGBT sort of the, the tail end of the inclusiveness uh, area? Um, I'm just curious about the inclusiveness generally and measurement around it. Yeah, I, I actually I love that word, and, and I don't know that we've really articulated good metrics for that word inclusion. You know, a, a lot of our path on diversity, rightly or wrongly, has been set by metrics that you know, government set. Let's let's be honest. EEO requirements or um, yeah. kind of those basics that at least you as companies have to do. But when you really are looking at operating in hundreds of con countries around the world with many different interfaces and different cultures, that inclusion is really hard. And and maybe after you know 25, 30 years um, of work at this. You can sort of say, well, we got the policy thing checked off. Isn't everybody happy now? What's, what's the problem? But I think Todd summed it up well that there's still nearly half, nearly half of LGBTs in general that are not out at work. Um, I remember uh, five or six years ago, I was leading our uh, LGBT uh, employee network and kept sort of trying to deconstruct, well, why? Why? What is it that's limiting people? Why won't they come out? And what I kind of learned through that is there are very important cultural totems. You know, the survey will talk about in leadership, you know, well, why measure how many executives are out? Or why measure how many LGBTs are on the board? Or why measure, you know, if any of them ever spoke publicly about LGBT issues? Um, of course they do, or, or of course we have that. But those totems are so important because it leads to um, signals that we care, that we mean it, that the environment is safe, and and I think that's so so important for particularly LGBTs, but the the knock on effect uh, to other diverse communities enjoy that as well. I think we learn through aspects of diversities that LGBTs are in benefits that happen throughout many many different types of you could say a diversity whether it's disabilities or religion. I mean, there's aspects that I think uh, all those pieces can learn from. So that's where I see an additional benefit, ground that we can plow through this survey and these learnings, actually help with inclusion overall from many different aspects, right? This doesn't have to be just about an LGBT type environment. Yeah, and it's such a good distinction you make because what I was struck by when the survey was complete and you sort of step back and look at it, is that almost every dimension, which is every section of the survey, for those who haven't seen it, addresses an, um, an action and a public role modeling aspect. So it's the talk and the walk. And if your company, across all these dimensions, isn't doing both the walk and the talk, then first of all, it's sending a disconnect. But more importantly, it's not leveraging the opportunity to, to connect them and you know, raise the bar on the inclusion. And again, our job is making that connection between that makes it much more forceful as a business opportunity. Yeah, um, there's one aspect if I could lift up another point. I mean, years yeah. ago, but I'm not sure if it's still very different today. When we kind of talk to employees that were not out, there there is this aspect of um, sharing that type of information, and what does that lead to? And you really have to learn from exemplars that allow people to self-identify and build trust of what to do with some of that data. 
because let's face it, there's still a layer of concern around what's going to happen with that data and how's it going to be used. So um, mm -hmm. I think companies that are in the forefront of beginning to to show how they're using that data can really instruct all of us. Mm -hmm. um, how about at RBC? What sort of, let's delve into the survey itself a little bit and, and sort of some of the surprises and key takeaways, um, whether on, I think you had mentioned marketing and communications perhaps. What, what popped up for you? I think one of the, the major takeaways that you know, I touched on earlier was uh, the monitoring piece and mm -hmm. And how we re really um, we we had all these initiatives, and we had you know recruiting initiatives, we had external engagement, we had cultural ally programs, um, and all these all these um, different elements coming together, but we had no way to measure it. So and we had no way to uh, measure the effect it was going to have on our employee base in retaining talent, attracting talent. Um, at the firm, and so one of the key pieces, uh, surprises, was how the self ID program and implementing it would actually um, unlock our strategy in the other six dimensions, and how once we were able to um, implement self ID over time, that would allow us to uh, look at the effects of external engagement, how. Um, our employees are engaging with our philanthropic programs or volunteerism. Uh, so, so I think it was it was interesting to see how you delineated these seven categories, yet at the same time they're not all mutually exclusive in the strategy. So interesting. So the self-identification is uh, the key question under the monitoring. Of, uh, we have monitoring sort of meta obviously that we hope people will measure and monitor, but also particularly if you don't know how many LGBT employees you might have, you just don't have a, a basis point. Chris, you mentioned something um, when you were taking the survey and looking through about leadership succession. Something popped up. Can you expand a little bit on that and, and whether that was a surprise and, and, and a takeaway or what else about the survey across any of these dimensions? Uh, and, and actually it ties into the, the self ID and as well and, and just knowing who our role models were and who, who our people are that are entitled leadership roles. So we, we knew we had some pretty visible out leadership, out executive leadership at the firm, but we, we hadn't thought about who was behind them. And, and I think some of the questions that really came up through the leadership section helped us focus in a little bit more on that because it just didn't say who are your top tier executives. It, it gave a list of, of many different thoughtful people to, to get behind. And, and admittedly, we had to translate it a little bit sometimes because our, our titles are, are different and our roles are different, uh, especially when we started looking at it globally. But it gave us a way to really then um, be thoughtful about who are we positioning and, and are there people that we right now know, uh, you know, one of our top leaders, for example, will be retiring in the next few years. So do we have people behind that are going to be able to be our visible role models and, and be external in the marketplace in, in the same kind of way that we've, we've been able to do with her. And, and it was asking those kinds of questions that in the background that really helped us. So, I mean, going back again to the, there wasn't just a yes, no response to the questions. There, there was more of the, um, how do we use this information based on, on how we need to capture the information to, to answer the question correctly, but then there's more to this that we can use for a strategy and planning process that uh, really helped us not only on that leadership question, but geez, uh, on, a, on a number of these other ones too. Mm -hmm. And in choosing to take the test, as I understand you did it regionally for the U.S. instead of globally, that was um, what, what your setup was. Uh, are you aspiring uh, to, uh, of course, the, the cultural landscape is highly uneven, as we know, globally, but are you hoping to sort of share best practices from your experience with this to other leaders um, in EY groups around the world and in other countries? Yeah, the, actually the, the aspiration for us is, is right now to have a number of our, of our different countries that, that are um, excelling to, to, to all take it and compare our answers. Um, because as we were looking through it, I mean, the great part about it, and I, I know it, it's kind of hard to envision if you haven't seen the report out yet, but not only do you get the response back of what you've done well, 
um, you get the areas for improvement, and then you get comparison with other companies. And, and so that was really helpful in, in understanding from, from the U.S. perspective. But, but then yeah. as we were talking, we know that in our, our U.K. group, for example, is really strong. And, and many, many of the policies and the things that have been done over there, we're finding we complement each other where we had some weaknesses. And so we're able to identify some of those weaknesses when we know what's happening. We were starting to compare it, as, as Todd had mentioned before, between all the different kinds of other surveys that were external. And using this as an internal tool to help us compare across countries, we're seeing as a, a good path to help us level the playing field in all the different countries. Mm -hmm. I love that idea of sharing best practices, and I'm picturing the little global committees at these large companies. <laughs> In my dreams. Lots of conference calls. <laughs> Lots of conference calls. Gail, do you have anything else to share on both the surprises and, and some of the takeaways, uh, and, and aspirationally where you might want to roll this forward? Well, I want to think a little bit about our audience. You know, a, a lot of times um, LGBTs themselves at companies or the networks get involved in this, but from an HR standpoint, you know, this is, I don't know what out, out leadership is going for, but this is maybe not the tool to get on a bunch of lists and get awards, right? This is really the tool to say, we yeah. truly value our employees, we want true respect, and we want to bring all our employees uh, feel included to the degree that they can bring them whole selves to work. And, and there's, we all know, huge business case and huge value there. So like I had said earlier, this gives you all the nuggets of, of things you can pursue. Um, you know, in terms of surprises, honestly, I, I wasn't. I think um, one of our HR people in our, our org vibrancy um, filled out the survey, and I think their feedback was it'd be helpful to kind of get a little maybe tutorial or just have a little dialogue with some of her peers around other companies and how do we interpret some of the questions, you know. When you get a get beyond, oh, maybe I misinterpreted this or that, but those true longer reaching nuggets. I think for DuPont, um, as you mentioned, science and, and engineering and being very data driven, it, it is that data drives awareness, it drives understanding, and from a leadership standpoint, frankly, it helps drive accountability. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us that operate in business realize that those are things that are hugely important and someone to kind of keep holding up the mirror with, with tools like this to say, you know, we agreed to focus on these few things, here's, here's where we are the next year and the next year. Um, with average scores around 50 or 60 percent, we're not all going to be A students and that's probably good, right? We know there's opportunities because we want those other 50 percent of people that aren't out to begin over time to, to feel comfortable to be themselves. Mm -hmm. And again, I want to reiterate, just setting the stage again for those who um, I hope will consider taking the survey, it's not about committing resources except intellectually and right prioritization-wise. It's not about suggesting that companies need to spend more money at all. Um, it's about, as all of you have helpfully pointed out, taking a close look at what the drivers are, specifically, discreetly across these dimensions, so that they add up to a strategic path forward that leadership can say, oh, well, that makes some sense. So it's more a tinkering, right, with the tools rather than saying, oh, don't ask me for more money. Of course, not money. Um, it's about how internally are you prioritizing your efforts and how strategic are you being in these different uh, areas. Um, so I have a question about um, just to help people understand in terms of literally taking, Chris, did you in your office with colleagues go through, and I should also say, um, when one takes the survey, there, we, we try to put in these friendly signs, encouraging signs about one can call Matt, um, you're halfway there, that sort of thing. It may not take an hour, an hour and a half, it might take an hour and 45, depending. Um, but um, for any of these, what we didn't want was to have um, you know, any uh, confusion around title, brand, region, whatever. Um, so we have a hotline right here just to say that anyone is welcome to call, but I'm, I'm hearing that I think we need to make that a little more prominent because we should be that resource. We should be the resource for anybody who, who needs a little helping hand uh, going through it. So, so Chris, starting with you, did you mostly do it yourself? Did you send pieces out to other people? Um, just literally the, the specifics of going through the survey. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, th I think that's 
that's one of the nice parts about this. It was easy enough for me to sit down and take the first run through it. And, and I did. Um, being the first time we were taking it, I, I didn't want to dole it out. And uh, I, I wanted to understand what was making it up. And, and you all were great about asking for feedback and, and taking it. And that back and forth, as you even said, about asking questions. Uh, I did a little bit of that just because our structure is different. And there, were, there was uh, one whole section at one point. We, we don't have a board of directors at EY. Um, so, you know, I, I, I didn't want to just ignore that whole section, but it, at the same time, it didn't apply. So yeah. we, we actually interpreted it a different way so that it would have a little bit more meaning for us. Mm -hmm. But, I, I mean, the first run through I took, and, and then I, I actually doled out the pieces after that and shared it with the, the, the different groups of people and, and asked, you know, do we have this in place? And uh, are, are there things that, that we need to... And are you reading this the same way I did, or are there things that you think we need to be doing differently or answering this differently uh, that, that I, I went through after the fact? But I took the first run through it. And I think that was helpful because there were some pieces that, that were different, um, the leadership piece especially, uh, mm -hmm. the, the external communications, um, you, you know, you'd mentioned. That, that was one that we struggled with a little bit in part because we're, a, we're business to business. and. Sure. Being a business to business, we, we didn't have that consumer focus, and, and so uh, we didn't score as well on it, but at the same time, I don't think we should have scored as well on it. So, you know, we didn't have some of those pieces that would make sense in there, and I think that's what was okay about it. It was right. coming back and saying, yes, we don't have to get that 100% because this piece may not be as applicable to us. Right. Um, great. Thank you. Um, Gail, do you have a perspective on the taking of the, I know you're, you're HR staff and their diversity office played the lead in this. Did they give you feedback about the ease or difficulty? It sounds like. Uh... Yeah, I think, you know, for anybody, the first time through, it's news. So you got to pay a little more attention. It takes a little more time. got to know who to talk to. And, and I kind of reflect back when um, maybe some other surveys we, we dove into. And th there's a little bit of activation energy and a little more effort. Uh, but really what's more important is engaging in that conversation afterwards. I mean, we're a company, as you mentioned earlier, we, we just merged with Dow and we'll be splitting into three. And, and what, what I think I'm finding is, you know, any kind of um, transformation going on in a company is a time of opportunity and it's a time that things could, you know, get taken for granted. And it kind of renewed for me that I shouldn't take for granted all our progress over, you know, 20, 30 years, that we, we have to stay vigilant. There's new leadership. There's going to be three new companies formed. And why shouldn't we aim for those to be, you know, exceedingly great companies as we architect them for inclusion and diversity uh, for LGBTs and all? And I think that dialogue may be... It, needs to be a little more prominent, and, and we're, we are working on that. It, it's sort of helped uh, increase where it is on my priority list, if you could say. Right. How about at RBC? Yeah, so we uh, had HR and diversity in partnership with the Employee Resource Group, and so we sat down and took a run at the survey, and I think it took us an hour or two the first time, and we just flagged a couple things that uh, we need to follow up on and uh, you know, reached out to um, some of the uh, various parties, I think it's the um, supplier of diversity okay. and looking into um, you know, any political involvement and, uh, and received those answers and, uh, and then finished it off. That's great. I see the ERGs as a potential, not just resource, but an empowering, something to empower that group. You know, so that um, an LGBT employee resource group or business resource group anywhere should have this information, right? It's, it's sort of something that um, captures all of the efforts that, that, that their company is doing around LGBT inclusion. And, and it, they can become advocates for change. And they can also just be really justifiably proud of all the work that is going on. Um, so I'm glad you mentioned that because I think that's uh, a sort of a promising area um, of development. Um, I'm going to pause in case, do we have any questions? I wanted to leave uh, enough time, but I have plenty of other questions if not. I know we wanted to make this um, interactive. So Paul is, is asking me the, the questions. Um, 
So it feels a little like a game show. And the first question is, so the process of implementing the survey. So, so I, can, I can generally answer this. This sounds like it's less for you guys. Um, in terms of implementing the survey, the cost is nothing. It's uh, free. Uh, the timeline, um, as you've heard from our panelists, uh, if you zoomed through and know everything there is to know about your company from your chair, it might just take you an hour, but it will probably take you a couple of hours, particularly if you want to kick the tires with your colleagues. Um, and the resources that you need from a survey company for a successful outcome, well, that's a very interesting question. So a successful outcome is in the eye of the you know, beholder test taker. Um, success, for me, if I were at a company and, and uh, in a position of responsibility um, around inclusion efforts or, or have an interest in it, success would be to understand what we're doing. And the reason I've been so pumped up about OLIQ is it takes this picture and you actually have this kind of heat map of strengths and opportunities spelled out in front of you. And you can choose to do nothing, but if you want to know how you're doing, that to me is a successful outcome of completing the survey and saying, here's how we're doing. I think it would probably be more successful if, uh, if particularly if this is part of uh, your, your interest or your job responsibility, to then put that into play and figure out what's changeable, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense given one's company, um, but just give an aspirational um, uh, you know, sort of a bar to achieve. But I don't want to be doing, that. does that make sense, make sense to you guys? Does that sound like a successful outcome? Yeah, for us, you know, w once we got the uh, survey results, it, it was energizing because we felt like we had a roadmap in front of us that we could choose three things that we're going to do over the next year that will have a tangible impact on our strategy. And I think the great thing for this, this survey is that next year when we do it again, we'll have some accountability around, okay, how, how has our score changed and where have we improved and what's our roadmap going to look like the next year? Mm -hmm. and, and what sort of things are we going to focus on? So I, I think, you know, however you interpret the results, it's going to be very, because it's internal mm -hmm. to each company, mm -hmm. it, it's really your choice what to do with that, mm -hmm. that information. Mm -hmm. How about for you guys? Uh, very, very similar. I, I mean, there were, there were some pieces. We did not run it through our ERG. We we're sharing the results with them actually at our upcoming annual meeting. Um, but it, it helped us to identify really a couple of those key things from a strategy perspective. So, uh, uh, for example, on the internal engagement piece, um, there was a, a question about, uh, you know, how, how do you align all of your all of your giving, and making sure that your policies were aligned to to make sure you were supportive of LGBT causes and. And that, you know, we thought, ah, oh, this one, that, that's a 100% one. We got all of that. Um, we didn't think about our pack. And, and so, you know, being, ha having it raised different questions about different aspects of, of your, your giving and your, your external engagements um, helped us to identify those couple of places, too, where we needed to ask the questions and make sure that, uh, that our, our alignment of policies elsewhere were lining up everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me kind of of a, frankly, kind of another piece of work we had done a few years ago where we realized, you know, in the whole area of dealing with suppliers, we had not maybe really brought the dimension of LGBT suppliers. We had done a lot of work over the years over minority suppliers and working with the Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce and that, you know, resulted after a few years of, of getting an award for them. But it, it really shows you um, those nuggets is, is critical. Uh, Jeff said, those nuggets that you can focus on and drive an improvement over a couple year period. So I look forward to, at least with our ERG, uh, maybe getting engaged uh, as they see the results, as, as maybe recasting their annual objectives. And it, it really brings you these things you hadn't ever thought about, which I think is hugely powerful. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, one of the questions, um, just a reminder, you can type your questions into your control panels if you have questions you'd like uh, to add. Um, one of the questions was, is there a copy of the survey that one can just see? And the answer is yes. Um, 
And if you send Matt or myself or Paul an email, Matt is our uh, the main guy, and he is Matt dot four acre, one of my favorite last names, A C R E at outleadership dot com. He'll send you a copy of the survey so that you can see it um, and have a PDF. Sometimes people find that helpful, obviously, before actually engaging in the link itself. That said, once you click on the link, you can start it. You can go away. Uh, nothing will, uh, it will, it will disappear after a month, I think, of inactivity so that it doesn't um, uh, impact the benchmarking. But you may start and complete it within that broad time frame. You can go on vacation and come back and spend the last 20 minutes um, you know, doing that sort of thing, whatever, whatever works for you. Um, I have a quick question on um, sort of this notion of maybe survey fatigue. So at these, at your large companies, as I understand it, you might get, you know, at, like DuPont for sure, and I imagine why I don't know about RBC, you probably complete a hundred surveys a year. I don't know. Let me. What do you think? I could you know? quantify it. No. Probably now. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> um, do you guys have a sense? Yeah, I'm going to say I don't have the number memorized, but uh, every aspect of diversity has a number of different surveys, a number of different recognitions, and, and we, we do. At this point, we decide which ones we're going to fill out and which ones we're not because they take time. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's why, that, that's why as we talk about this one, it, it really does bring something different to the table because it's not about that recognition like many of the others are. In fact, I, I don't know of, of any other that, that is doing this right now where mm -hmm. it gives you that chance to really benchmark internally and, and work through, as I mentioned before, not only what you're not doing, um, what, what you are doing, what you're not doing, and what others in, your, in, your, in the area are, are doing that have taken the survey. So it, it gives you that benchmark quality that I think sometimes is a little bit harder to get mm -hmm. and a little bit harder to understand and, and to see where your gaps are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it, it, Learning from this, whether you formally take the survey or not, it gives you thought-provoking areas that you can use as ripe for discussion. And sometimes we got to benefit from the discussion almost more than, than the kind of driving a, its result. Mm -hmm. And many of us have been involved in years and years of driving policy change, right? Mm -hmm. Driving culture change and systemic change is much, much harder. And I think we've all reached some edges of that that we've gotten stuck. Uh, in different ways. And uh, to Chris's point, you know, I think certain areas now we can sit there and go, well, we want to find out what other companies really are doing the self ID and what were the challenges and things that we thought we worry about and they didn't end up worrying about and have a little dialogue around that. So it brings a whole new level of dialogue into the picture, which I think is, is got to be helpful because it, it is a thousand points of light that are going to make this better. Mm -hmm. Is it a good idea for us to gather best practices from what we're seeing as the benchmarks emerge and we see patterns among different kinds of companies? What would you guys find helpful as we beef up the data and when we have solid benchmarks per industry regionally? Um, how would you find the benchmarking helpful, if you would? I, I think that would be enormously helpful. Um, you know, when, when we set about um, finding that we need to increase our monitoring and, and get some more data around that. You know, uh, Chris on the panel really helped us out in terms of their experience and their best practices. And I think as we move forward in you know gathering these best practices across all the metrics, I think when people uh, and companies see the results and say, okay, now that I know that this is a big opportunity for us, you know, how do, how do we actually go about uh, achieving that and, you know, what are uh, some of the best practices around implementing that strategy or, um, you know, things to highlight, things to avoid uh, when implementing it, I think will be a massive help. Mm -hmm. And, and I think what Jeff just said there too is important. Sometimes it's not all the time that it takes to put the best practices together and share them. Um, sometimes that takes a lot of time on both parts, but sometimes just the conversation, if you can help facilitate, of we know this company has some leading practices and we can help connect you with companies that are doing this, that, that is incredibly powerful to, to us. Right, and it also helps you figure out, you know, these are the barriers we're facing in trying to 
you know, get, improve in this front or that front, and learning from somebody else on what they did is, is enormously helpful. It speeds ev up everybody's journey. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a smart takeaway, and, and um, needless to say, we also are at uh, leadership available to do workshops and, and talk companies through, whether on any aspect of it in general. We've had a couple of requests from companies to say, we don't want to start this without you coming and doing it with us. Um, and of course, we're happy to do that as well. Um, literally, sort of at your elbow, um, if that's useful. And then, in particular, pointing out, you know, the the easiest opportunities, which sometimes is a good way to prioritize. Um, it's not always the most courageous, but it's it's the easiest from my perspective. Um, did, were there any other questions you want me to address, Paul? Do you guys have any questions for each other before we start wrapping up? I was curious to see. <laughs> about your experience or usage of the survey. Maybe you've been hearing yourself already describe it. Well, i got two new people I'm going to be calling when I have questions about things now. So, Excellent. Well, so everybody knows what we'll do moving forward. We'll continue to make information available as it becomes available. Um, we'll highlight um, benchmarking and other takeaways at our, um, at our summits. Um, in the communications that go out to our member companies um, and to other interested parties, obviously. Um, and I should say that OLIQ, just so you know how it's affected the work that we do on the advisory side, it has helped us understand and provide a sort of a prism through which to see how companies can optimally perform around LGBT inclusion. So what started for us as a way for companies to help themselves see where they, you know, can improve and, you know, if, and if the sun is shining, maybe they want us to come help them, that would, that's fine too. But what's been so interesting to see is how it's even turned around where it's, it becomes this filter through which we um, experience, you know, even looking at leadership, even as we section out by dimension. If we go talk to a company about leadership, we have our checklist. Um, and we will continue to refine that. Um, we understand that monitoring is super important and very few people are doing it. And so that's moving up in our own conversational agenda with member firms and at summits and in the, and in the advisory conversations we have. So it's been a discovery uh, and a help for us and um, everyone will continue who follows out leadership uh, to see us uh, with, those, with those takeaways. So, if there are no more questions, um, I think I will wrap up. Does that sound right, Paul? So I'll let you know that the, is, is the recording going to be available? Yeah. Okay. So and housed on our site. Okay. So if anybody has questions, wants to share it, it has been recorded. Um, just you know, write to us if you need help figuring out where it is. I believe it'll be posted on the site, but we're happy to make it available. I want to say thank you so much, Gail, Chris, Jeff, for sharing your time and insights. And I hope you guys have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. All right. Thanks so much. Take care. All right.